Okay, well, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I've already read the text that we're going to be looking at this morning. So let me just connect this to what it is that we have been looking at. I always like to have connections between you know, where we're at and where we've been, and not just sort of start off uh, with something entirely new. And actually what I would like to do after we've done this and after next week when we look at the resurrection, I'd like to go into the book of Galatians uh, because you know, we've, we've referred to that book so many times and it's so important to, to the picture of what Paul has painted for us in the book of Romans. But I think it's important that we understand the message of that letter as well. But last week, as you know, we finished Paul's letter to the Romans. That was his communication that he sent to Rome uh, to tell them that he was on his, his way. He, you know, he had finished evangelizing, remember, the Eastern Mediterranean. And he wanted to go toward the West as far as Spain and was going to go by Rome. And he hadn't been there yet. So he was writing the letter to tell them of his intentions. But... He was also writing because he wanted to make sure that they were grounded in, in the truth. You know, uh, Paul wrote this letter around the same time the Judaizers were trying to turn people away from God's grace alone and bring them back to the law of God to keep the ceremonial law and be circumcised and so forth. Again, that's why Galatians is so important. He wanted to make sure that these Roman believers didn't fall into that same snare. So he explained to them very thoroughly the gospel of God's free grace to sinners who deserve only judgment. So again, the exposition of the gospel, that's, that's what the letter was all about. Now, we hear these things so often. You know, that's what we want to emphasize every week. Remember how Luther said, and again, there Luther, we, we really appreciate the Reformers because they had a lot of, of godly wisdom that came from the Word of God. One thing that Luther said, and I'll repeat it again, is that every week he preached uh, the gospel of God's free grace, justification by grace through faith alone to his people because every week his people would forget. Now, they lived in an environment, you know, an ecclesiastical environment, having coming out, come out of the Roman Catholic Church that... It was based upon works, and that's the reason why Luther had to keep reminding him, no, it's, it's of God's grace. But we tend to have kind of the opposite problem, don't we? we? We hear about justification by grace through faith alone, and we tend to think that there are no works that are involved. But um, that, that isn't the case. We, need, we do need to remember that um, works are very much a part of it, but not in the way that Rome believes. They remember Rome, Rome has really taken the grace of God and turned it into a system of works. And if, if you're not aware of what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, I thought I would just remind us this morning because they are a part of the historic Christian church. Okay? But if you believe their doctrine, if you believe what they teach regarding how we are made right with God, you won't be saved. And again, Paul explains that very clearly in the book of Galatians. Well, they believe, again, that uh, there are certain things that we need to do. We need to be baptized by a priest, one that's in apostolic succession from Peter, and those are only found in the Roman church. And we need that baptism to get rid of the guilt of Adam. That's the way it, it's taken away. And when we are baptized, and they believe that, again, infants should be baptized, that, that this is what they call first justification, a perfect justification, a perfect righteousness, and a perfect acceptance by God. That act of baptism alone makes that child right before God. That's, but that's a work done by a priest to save an infant. But when we destroy that justification through our sins, and we all inevitably would do that, according to Rome, we need to repair it okay, through what they call the second plank of justification, penance. Okay, penance is contrition. Okay, being sorry that I have offended God. And, of course, we should be sorry when we sin that we've offended God. Confess. Well, we need to confess our sins to God, but they believe we need to confess them to a priest and then receive his absolution, the priest's pronouncement of forgiveness. I absolve you. Okay, well, priests, they believe that their priests have the authority to absolve you from your sins if, if you appear to be contrite. And then the priest gives you works to do works of satisfaction. 
And that is to undo the damage that, that you've caused by the sin that you've, that you've done. We don't often think about that as Protestants, do we? Every time we sin, we do injure somebody or something, right? Um, well, we, you know, well, the thing is, we need to undo that damage. If we've stolen, we need to make restitution, right? If we've injured somebody, we need to, again, make some form of restitution. We, at the very least, need to ask for forgiveness. But we don't do that to a priest. We, do, we confess to the Lord, we're sorry, and we do these things, and we receive his absolution, which is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and that is confessing our sins to him. Now, they also believe that it is Rome, that we need to add confirmation and we need to add the mass because we need the grace these things provide so we can continue to get better and better, perfect ourselves until we're good enough for God to say, you know what, you have reached the standard and now you are just and now you can go straight to heaven when you die. But most people don't reach that point, so they have to go to purgatory. But again, all of these are works, and what we believe is, as Protestants, uh, what Martin Luther discovered through, again, his examination of Paul's letters, is that God justifies us by his free grace through the uh, imputed or credited or freely given righteousness of Jesus Christ that we receive uh, by faith. We are declared just by his righteousness, by this alien righteousness to Rome that's just a legal fiction. You're, it's just kind of a, you know, a fantasy that you're, you're hoping in. You really need to personally be righteous before God will accept you, but no, Paul says God justifies not the godly, but the ungodly. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this, this view, Rome's view on justification, is why Luther had difficulty with the book of James especially with the verse that we're looking at this morning because it seems to be teaching Rome's position. Now, Rome certainly believed that James was on their side, and, and so they pushed that, and that's one of the reasons why Luther pushed back against it. But we need to ask the question this morning, is, it, is that possible that the Bible could teach two contrary things? Paul is so clear on this matter, and he claims to be writing God's Word, but James also claims to be writing his word, but he seems to be flatly contradicting what Paul says. But we know that can't be the case because God cannot contradict himself. We know that these two things have to harmonize. So what I'd like to do this morning is, is to look at what James is actually telling us here about the relationship of works to faith to see that not only do he and Paul not contradict each other, but they actually agree with each other. And I want us to see what difference it makes. Because again, we, today we focus so much on the grace of God, the love of God, how God has done it all, Jesus has done it all, that it makes us sit on our laurels when it should be really compelling us to move forward with what the Lord has called us to do. And it's very important that we do that, okay, according to James and Paul. Okay, so first of all, we need to see, I think, first of all, we need to see there's no question about what Paul taught, okay? In Luther's mind, originally, there was a question, okay? Based upon Romans 1, verses 16 through 17, let me read that for you again. Very familiar passage, very encouraging passage when we understand it properly. Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, we understand what that means. We understand that that means if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll live by the righteousness he gives to us. But Luther did not understand that at all. He struggled for a long time with that term, God's righteousness, because he believed that that meant the righteousness by which God is righteous and by which he condemned Luther for his ungodliness, that God was righteous, but he was a sinner under God's wrath. And as long as he believed that this is what it meant, that the gospel was really just another law that God meant to condemn him, 
that he never found peace. And again, why did Luther believe that? It was because that's what the church was teaching in those days. It was the uniform belief of the church, though we have to believe there were those in it that saw it otherwise. But this is what Luther writes regarding his own conversion based upon this passage when he finally understood what it meant. He says, nevertheless, in spite of the ardor of my heart, I was hindered by the unique word in the first chapter of Romans. The righteousness of God is revealed in it. I hated the word. He should really use the word phrase. Righteousness of God. Because in accordance with the usage and custom of the doctors, I had been taught to understand it philosophically as meaning, as they put it, the formal or active righteousness according to which God is righteous and punishes sinners and the unjust. As a monk, I led an irreproachable life. Nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless. And I could not depend on God being propitiated, that is, satisfied, um, that his justice would be satisfied by my satisfactions, that is, by the way, I'm punishing myself and the works that I'm doing. I can't satisfy his justice. Not only did I not love, but I actually hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Thus, a furious battle raged within my perplexed conscience, but meanwhile, I was knocking at the door of this particular Pauline passage, earnestly seeking to know the mind of the great apostle. Day and night, I tried to meditate upon the significance of these words. The righteousness of God is revealed in it. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Luther took these things dead seriously. Okay? And as we're seeing in the evening, that's the way we should take God's word. Okay, but now this is what, how he concludes. <clears throat> then finally, God had mercy on me. And I began to understand that the righteousness of God is a gift of God by which a righteous man lives, namely by faith. And that sentence, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, is passive, indicating that the merciful God justifies us by faith as it is written the righteous shall live by faith. Now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether and had entered paradise. In the same moment, the face of the whole of Scripture became apparent to me. My mind ran through the Scriptures as far as I was able to recollect them, seeking analogies and other phrases, such as the work of God by which He makes us strong, the wisdom of God by which He makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God, just as intensely as, as I had now hated the expression, the righteousness of God, I now lovingly praised this most pleasant word. This passage from Paul became to me the very gate to paradise. So it's important that we understand what the word of God says, but he understood what Paul is saying and what he argues throughout the entire letter is that salvation is entirely the work of God given to us freely by His grace. Justification, being made right, being declared just by God, being accepted by Him, comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul wrote to the Galatians around this same time, as I mentioned before, against the Judaizers, who were teaching the Gentile believers, you must be circumcised and observe the law of Moses, as well as trust in Jesus to be saved that there is a work you need to do that you must add to God's grace before you can be justified. This is what Paul writes in Galatians 5, 1 through 6. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you and I testify again to every man who receives a circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything 
but faith working through love. Now, if Paul's telling us anything here, he's telling us this, that if we add anything to the work that God has done through Jesus Christ, even something as small as the right of circumcision to God's free grace as the grounds of our justification, and again, consider what the Roman Catholic Church added to the work of Christ. He says, anything you add is enough to destroy the gospel. It can't be by grace and by works because the two are opposites of one another. They're, they're on different ends of the pole. Paul writes in Romans 11, verse 6, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. I mean, grace is something that's given as a free gift that cannot be earned. Works is doing something to earn something else. It's the, the two are, again, on opposite sides of the continuum. They, they cannot be blended. Okay? It is by grace received by faith alone. Paul is absolutely clear on this point. So now let's contrast that with what James writes in our passage. Chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says that Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. You know, the interesting thing is he's quoting the same verse Paul uses to demonstrate that we are saved by grace through faith alone. James quotes it to say we're not justified by grace alone, but also by works. So, we, okay, we need to understand how these fit together. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, again, James seems to be saying just the opposite of Paul. And that's why Luther was suspicious of James' letter. But again, God cannot contradict himself. Somehow, these two authors must agree. Now, the way to reconcile them we know is really quite simple. James is speaking of a different kind of justification than Paul is speaking of. Remember the law of non-contradiction? Okay? Something cannot be A and non-A at the same time and at the same relationship. Now, if Paul and James were talking about the same thing, they're flat, flatly contradicting each other. But the problem is, or I should say the solution is, they're not talking about the same thing. They're talking about two different things. Paul is telling us how we can be justified before God, okay? And that's what we usually think of when we think of justification. Because justification means, you know, the vindication of, of one's, oh, whatever it is you're claiming, or whatever it is, um, maybe you personally. Um, this justification before God is when we are vindicated in God's sight. That's what we usually think of as justification. The justification that comes by God's free grace through Christ's righteousness that saves us, okay? But that's not what James is talking about here. James is speaking about how our faith is justified, not before God, but how faith is justified before man, okay? How we demonstrate, how we prove that we really do have the faith that justifies us before God. We prove that to man by the way that we live, by the things that we do. Okay, I, I hope that, that part of it's clear. And again, consider the examples that James gives to us here. First of all, in verses 15 and 16, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Okay. So what he's saying here is, if we say that we are concerned for a brother or sister in need, but we only wish them well, I hope you find what you need. I hope God provides for you. I'll pray for you, you know. But we don't give them what they need. It, are, are we showing by our actions that we really do care about them? I mean, if we have what they need and we don't give it to them, and yet we say we do, well, no, we're not. Okay, we're actually proving just the opposite. Well, James says the same thing is true of faith. If we say that we believe, okay, believe the Bible, believe 
God, believe what Christ says, but we don't act consistently with that belief, then what we're, we're doing is we're not really telling the truth. We're really lying. We're showing that we really don't believe those things. Okay, same thing with regard to Abraham. When Abraham offered his son Isaac on the altar, James is telling us, he showed us that he really believed God. You know, you, you put your money where your mouth is, you know, so to speak. This is where the you know, rubber hits the road. He acted on that faith. Now, what is it that, that he did? Well, remember, God had promised to Abraham before he had any children that his children would be as numerous as the stars of heaven or as the sand on the seashore. But he also, as after Abraham had Isaac, he said, it's through Isaac that your seed or this promise is going to be fulfilled. I'm going to bring all these children through him. And then God says to Abraham, I want you to take Isaac to a certain mount, you know, mountain in Moriah, and I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. And you know what that means. Put him to death, burn his body to ashes as an offering to the Lord. Now you see what God commanded him to do was in conflict with the promise, because by, at this time, Isaac was still not married. He had no children. And if he kills him and burns his body into ashes, how is God's promise going to be fulfilled? So what did Abraham do? Did he say, well, if I do that, Lord, there's, there's no way I'm going to have, you know, this huge family, so I can't do it. No, rather, he looked at the promise of God, which said, through Isaac, your seed shall be named. And he reasoned that God's going to fulfill that promise. So even if I sacrifice Isaac on this altar, God is going to raise him from the ashes. He is going to live and he is going to have those children. That requires faith to believe that. Abraham even got as far as raising the knife and he was going to follow through. But then the Lord stopped him when he said, now I know that you fear God and, and that you do believe. And God knew that, but... Now Abraham knew it, and now we knew it, okay? Abraham showed us that he believed by his willingness to carry out this, this command that seemed to be opposite to the promise. And the same thing with Rahab. How do we know that Rahab believed God's promise that he was going to give the land that she was living in? Remember, she lived in Jericho. To the Jews, well, she showed that she did when she hid the messengers, remember the spies that... Israel sent to spy out the land, came into her house, and when she heard the soldiers were looking for them, she hid them on the roof, and then she sent the soldiers out on a wild goose chase. And that, at the risk of her own life, she showed that she believed the promise of God by acting on that faith. Now, what James is telling us here is that there are two different kinds of faith, a faith that's alive and a faith that's dead. A faith that saves and a faith that doesn't save. A living faith that changes the way we live, the decisions we make, and a dead faith that leaves us unchanged. Now, I think we all understand what a living faith is, but what's this dead faith that James is referring to? Well, this is what traditionally, historically, the church has known as historic faith. It is a belief in the facts of the gospel a belief that what the Bible says is true, you know, that, that these things really happened. Jesus really did become incarnate. He really did live. He really did die. He really did rise from the dead. Um, we believe these things to be true. It's the kind of faith that Jesus speaks about, by the way, in the parable of the, the sower. Remember where he talks about the stony ground hearers and the thorny ground hearers? I mean, they believed. They received the word, uh, and even seemed to look, you know, like they were going to do something with it. But it ended up, they didn't bring any fruit. You know, their lives didn't produce fruit, and they ended up withering away because they didn't have any genuine faith. Historic faith is the kind of faith they had, and it's the kind of faith that we can talk other people into, okay, through our apologetics. You know, we're going through apologetics in the evening, and we think about, well, uh, how do we present a convincing case for the existence of God and the Bible being His Word so we can show them the gospel. We want, well, we have, I think, an absolutely compelling case, and, and it can convince people <laughs> that all these things are true. But it can't save them, okay? It can't give them a living faith. It can only give them 
a dead faith. So then the question is, why do it at all? Well, it's because it's through these truths that God does bring the living faith, okay, through His Holy Spirit. We have to share those things with them. But just convincing them is, is not enough, okay? A dead faith is the kind of faith James tells us that the demons have. He writes in verses 19 and 20, you believe that God is one, you, you know, which is the, um, well, what would you say, the, the Shema, remember, the, the confession of Israel, um, you know, that, that God, the Lord our God is one God and so forth. You, you believe that, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? What he's saying is the demons, they're orthodox. They believe. They believe the facts. They know these things are true. They, they know God exists. What we're trying to prove with apologetics, that they know what he's like. They know the Bible is his word. They know that he's going to do exactly what he said that he would do. Okay? So they have historic faith. And what is their response to that? James says they shudder. Okay? They're afraid because they know it's true. They're more affected by their beliefs, by their convictions, than most professing Christians are today. You know, most professing Christians don't even open their Bibles and read it, and they, they don't really have reference to it. They, they're living like the rest of the world and not really taking seriously the way Luther did, taking seriously the Word of God and framing their lives on that as though their lives depended on it, because our lives do depend on it. The point is is really, you know, this, that they're not saved by that kind of faith, okay? They're not saved by a faith that doesn't produce works because a saving faith produces works. Now, that's what James is telling us, isn't it? It's quite obvious, quite, quite plain. And that means that he is not in conflict with Paul at all. Because Paul also believes that saving faith will produce works. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us that that is the reason why God saved us in the first place. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he writes this, For we are His workmanship, as God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So why did God save us? is that we might do good works, is that He might turn us from doing sinful things to doing the right things, okay? And the right things are worshiping God and showing kindness to your neighbor, you know? Loving God and your neighbor. That's, that's why He saved us. Now, Paul says He didn't save us just to do that, but He saved us so that we might be zealous in doing that very thing. He writes to Titus, that Christ Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. James says, faith without works is dead. Okay, do we understand what he means? If the faith that God gives is a faith that creates a zeal for good works, and yet the faith we lay claim to doesn't produce any change of life at all, then... We understand what James means when he says faith without works is useless. It cannot save us. Okay, so now we need to think about well, what difference does this make? Well, first of all, we need to see there's no conflict between James and Paul, right? If Luther had seen this, and I'm sure he did eventually, it would have alleviated his concerns early on, but you can understand why Luther had these concerns because Rome was pointing to James and saying, you see, you need to work, you need to work, you need to do so many works and get good enough for God to save you. That's not what James is saying at all. So it alleviates the conflict. Secondly, we need to understand that there is a faith that does not save. Okay? There are some people who don't understand that. There, there are many professing Christians who do not understand that. Years ago, Don and I went to a debate between somebody we consider to be a hero of the faith, John MacArthur. He was debating Earl Rodmacher, who has since gone to be with the Lord, who was the president of Western Seminary. And they were debating his book, The Gospel According to Jesus. Okay? Now, in that debate, Earl Rodmacher, president of Western Seminary, doctor in theology, publicly stated 
that dead faith saves you. Dead faith saves you. And what was his reasoning? Well, dead faith to be dead, if it's faith at all, any kind of faith, it had to be living once, even though it happens to be dead now. And if it was living at all at any time, that means that you must be saved because, you know, we're saved by faith and you can't lose your salvation. And so even if that faith has died, you're still saved. That, that was his reasoning. I still remember it after all these years because we're talking about a long time ago. But it's so obviously... It's so obviously wrong. The problem is, though, there are still many people who believe that. The college that I was going to believed that. Dallas Theological Seminary at the time uniformly believed that. There may have been some, some exceptions. I hope there were. My neighbor across the street years ago believed that. He was a professing Christian. There's so many people who believe it. But what we need to see is James is telling us that nothing could be further from the truth. James asks in verse 14, what use is it, my brethren, if somebody says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? See, James is asking that very question. Now, A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar who wrote, the, again, the thickest Greek grammar that has ever been written, so he was an expert in the Greek language. He said this question that James is asking expects a negative answer. Can that faith save him? No, it can't save him. I mean, it's clear from what James is arguing. And then when he comes to his conclusion in verse 26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Dead faith cannot save you because it shows that you haven't truly been born again. Okay? That's why the Reformers said, We are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. And what they meant by this is that sanctification, growth into the Christ image, becoming more like Him, holiness, love, okay, growth in love always <coughs> follows justification. If the Spirit is living in us, He will sanctify us. You know, that's what Paul was saying in the passage we read earlier and why Galatians is such an important letter. Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. You see, this faith that saves is a loving faith, and this loving faith changes the direction that we go. It produces love, creates love toward God and toward man. And so the final thing we need to see is that if we have saving faith, if we have living faith, the only kind that saves, we will love as Jesus loved, which means we will love the Father, we will love God, and I need to be careful here because it means we will love Jesus, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit more than anything else. We will have them as the very center of our lives. And what that means is the expression of this love is seen in this way. We will worship God with our lives, consistent with His Word. We will keep the promises that we have made to Him, and we'll also keep the promises we make to one another. And this is the one that seems to be so difficult for Christians today. We will set apart His day to Him, and we will spend it with Him. Uh, that is the Lord's Day, the, the Christian Sabbath. We'll, we'll spend the entire day with, with the Lord. We'll get together with His people for worship, and we'll spend the rest of the day praying, reading the Bible, and, and, and doing recreational things that, that are not worldly recreational things, but things that make us you know, draw near to the Lord. A lot of beauty out there that uh, just speaks of God's glory that we can enjoy on this day, but the thing is, we, we need to really turn off the world and really focus on the Lord. And that's something that if we have a, a living, loving faith, a faith that works by love, we're not going to say, ugh, I don't want to do that. But we're going to say, ah, oh, I want to do that. I, uh, God gives to me a command to put everything else aside so I don't have to do all these things that get in my way during the week, and I can spend that day with Him. So we will love God. And we will also love our neighbor as ourselves, okay? 
and not just our brothers and sisters, and we won't just say be warm and be filled, but we will actually reach out to, to help them in need, but we'll also love our unconverted neighbors. We will be kind to them. We will show them mercy, even as our Heavenly Father shows mercy to, to wicked mankind. Okay? Jesus tells us in Luke 6, verse 35, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. I, I, I can't help but say at this particular juncture that there are those in the church who believe that, that God shows no kindness to unbelievers who are never going to repent and never trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a horrible view. But the view is that, that any good thing he gives them is only to condemn them in the end. That's his purpose. See, I, that, that doesn't describe the God that we worship. God is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And it's not kind to give something to someone in the hopes that they're going to be destroyed by that thing. You know, Kindness is showing them mercy, is showing them grace. And that's what God does for everyone, even the evil. And if we are to be like Him, which is what a living faith does, makes us more like Him, we will do the same. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Jesus, you know, when the lawyer was, was saying, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him this parable. Then he comes to the conclusion, and Jesus asks the lawyer this question, which of these three, the priest that passed by on the other side, remember the Jew that was, that was beaten and left for dead, the priest sees him and he walks by on the other side, and the Levite comes by and he walks by on the other side, and then his enemy comes by, the Samaritan, and he sees him, and he has compassion. His heart goes out to him, and he, he comes to him, and he he bandages up his wounds and he pours oil and wine on them and he puts them on his donkey and takes him to an inn and he puts him up for the night and, and he says, if, if, if it costs you anything more to the innkeeper, next time I see you, I will pay you. Now Jesus says, which of these three proved to be the neighbor you know, to this man in need? And obviously it was the Samaritan and the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Jesus said, go and do the same. Okay? Show mercy even to your enemies. Show kindness. Do good things. And that's what the Lord is really telling us this morning through, through James, is we need to go and we need, need to do the same. If we have a living faith, if we have the love of God's Spirit in our hearts, this is the way that we will see it. Okay? This is the way that everyone will see it. This is what will justify our claim to have a saving faith is if we love God and we love our neighbor. So may the Lord, again, help us to just step back and take a look at our lives and see where our faith is leading us. And remembering that we're not going to be perfect by any means. What we're looking for is, is are we doing these things? Are we going this direction? Because if there's any love in our hearts at all for the Lord, we will be. And that's what we need to be looking for. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's be thinking about these things, about living faith versus dead faith, as we prepare to come to the table. If we, if we don't see that love for God, we really shouldn't come to the table. But if we really do love Him, and we recognize we don't love Him as we should, and all of us should, you know, who, who know the Lord should be able to say that as well, we don't love Him as we should. As we come to the table, we need to remember that there is grace here that the Lord wants to give us to help us, not just the demonstration of His love and the Father's love in giving us the Son and the Son's love in giving His life, but there's the communication, the imparting of more of the Spirit's influence to strengthen our love for Him. So let's, let's pray and let's prepare ourselves to come to the table.